Hello and welcome to everybody. I'm Dr. Heidi Tvorek. I am the director of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar entitled Mind the Gap, Digital Trade Explosion versus Fragmented Digital uh, Fragmented Data Governance. And it's co-organized by CSEI and by uh, the Konwakai Chair. Japanese research, which is currently held by Professor Eve Tibergian, who will be our moderator for today. Um, so we're really thrilled and honored to have this honestly dream lineup today for this discussion, whom uh, Professor Tibergian will be introducing in a moment. Um, but before going further, I'd like to take a moment uh, to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, who have called this area home for many thousands of years and continue to do so today. And invite you then, because we're located all around the world, um, to think about those indigenous peoples upon whom you are currently residing. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to our, our moderator for today, who will be uh, Professor Eve Tabergian. So Eve, over to you. Thank you, Heidi. And uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and good morning for those of you in Asia. Uh, so I'm Yves Tibergen, Professor of Political Science and Kowakai Chair in Japanese Research, located in the Institute of Asian Research at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Uh, I'll start by giving special thanks to my colleague Heidi Tvorek and our wonderful student assistants, Pantea Pumalek, uh, Christina Song, and May Terazawa. Uh, this event tonight is part of our series of events on the theme of digital transformation. We call this Global Conversation about Digital Disruptions. And we believe that the digital transformation is one of the biggest changes in our lives and it affects all kinds of dimensions. So we explore different dimensions in different events. Today, we're aiming at unpacking the world of divided data and digital governance with the following objectives. We have three objectives and we're gonna go through those with this wonderful lineup. What are the implications of fragmented data governance on international data flows? What is at stake? when we have mushrooming, exponentially growing data flows and um, you know, a fragmented governance situation on the other side. Second, what are evolving paradigms, institutional arrangements and sources of innovation in data governance? And finally, which governance structures can sustain global connectivity, privacy and freedom, as well as equity and access? So we try tonight to bring different perspectives including views from inside the Indo-Pacific uh, region, which is at the heart of a lot of those changes. So I have a couple logistical announcements to make. Uh, first, the chat functions is disabled. Questions will be asked on the Q&A windows. Uh, next, please note that this webinar and the following Q&A session will be recorded. We will make the recording available on the websites of both Konwakai Chair and CSDI at the SPPGA of UBC. And then finally, you're not required to use your camera or microphone to participate in a Q&A session. Uh, the written questions can be submitted to everyone via the Q&A function and then will be upvoted. Uh, we will monitor the Q&A window and I will be, as the moderator, asking questions using attendees' first names only unless of course you choose to be anonymous. So now um, it's a great joy and great honor to introduce those wonderful speakers to all of us. Uh, so first to speak um, in, the, for, in response to the first question will be Professor Susan Ariel Aronson from George Washington University. Um, professor Aronson is a research professor and the director of the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub at GWU. This hub maps the governance of personal, public, proprietary data around the world and examines how it affects data-driven tech, human autonomy, and human rights. The hub also trains policymakers in data governance, digital trade, and emerging tech, such as XR. She's also a senior fellow at CG in Canada. She's the author of six books and numerous articles on digital trade, data governance, human rights, corruption, and good governance and she's finishing now uh, articles on data as a global public good. So there is a longer bio. This is a very short snippet and it's in the chat now. Uh, next is uh, Professor K.S. Park from Korea University Law School. 
Um, and I'll just say a few more things. He's one of the founders of OpenNet Korea and has written academically and been active in the internet, free speech, privacy, defamation, copyright, and international contracting spheres. He has given expert testimonies in high-profile free speech and privacy cases. He has also been a commissioner of the Korean Communication Standards Commission, a government entity censoring broadcasting and internet content, where he has given many dissenting opinions. He's also the funding editor and editor-in-chief of Korea University Law Review. Uh, and that's just a little bit of the bio of Professor Park. So there's more in the chat. Uh, next, uh, Stephanie Honey from Honey Consulting is a former trade negotiator and diplomat with over two decades of experience in international trade negotiations and domestic trade-related economic issues. Stephanie has worked with governments and business clients on trade issues in the Asia Pacific, including China, Southeast Asia, Australia, and the Americas, as well as Europe. Her main areas of interest include digital and services trade, the WTO and regional economic integration, and many more. Stephanie serves as the policy advisor, lead staffer to the New Zealand members of the APEC Business Advisory Council, and was until recently the associate director of the New Zealand International Business Forum. So we'll be glad to have a New Zealand perspective as well as the, the CG perspective here. Uh, next is Professor Henry Gao from Singapore Management University. Uh, Henry Gao is a leading expert on digital trade and e-commerce issues with law degrees from three continents. He started his career as the first Chinese lawyer at the WTO Secretariat. He has been an advisor on digital trade issues for many national governments, as well as the WTO, UN, World Bank, ADB, APEC, ASEAN, and the World Economic Forum. Widely published on digital trade issues, he has been cited in the World Trade Report by the WTO and the Digital Economy Report by UNCTAD. He sits on the advisory board of the WTO Chairs Program. So um, Henry will be at the heart of um, lots of the changes happening in the Indo-Pacific region on the governance side. And then finally, uh, we are very pleased to have with us Professor Masahiro Kawai from Erina and University of Tokyo, um, a great international economist who has been at Brookings, uh, John Hopkins Universities, and Todai. Uh, he has also served as Chief Economist for the World Bank's East Asia and Pacific region, Deputy Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs at the J Japanese Ministry of Finance, President of the Policy Research Institute of Japan's Finance Ministry, Special Advisor to the Asia Development Bank, President in Charge of Regional Economy Cooperation and Integration, and Dean and CEO of the Asia Development Bank Institute, ADBI. In addition, Dr. Kawai is a Counselor of the Bank of Japan, a Senior Fellow at the Policy Research Institute of Japan's Ministry of Finance, and the Vice President of the Council on East Asia Community. And there's many more things as well uh, to say about so Professor Kawai and all his publications as well. So this is in the chat. Um, and so now without further ado, I'm gonna start, uh, we're gonna jump right away with three big questions uh, and we'll ask short answers for, from each of the panelists. And then I'll have a follow-up for individual panelists afterwards. And here is the first question that I'm gonna start asking uh, uh, Susan um, and everyone else. We know that digital flows and technologies are growing exponentially and will represent an ever-growing part of international trade. How do you evaluate our international governance structure at the moment for those digital flows? On a scale from one to 10, we're very demanding here. Can I share the, the screen? Can I could just, could you let me share the screen for one second? Uh, yes, but okay. I'll... Uh, you can share. So I'm going to give, I'm going to give, because um, it says it's disabled. I'm going to give it a two. And what I want to talk about, I'd just like to share a slide, but um, it's just not letting me. It says it's disabled. So maybe I think our team will make it work very quickly. Uh, they will send, okay, it works now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you guys can see, the reason I give it a two is not only does it really not understand what data is, but it doesn't really discuss 
uh, the multi-dimensional nature of data, right? Because data is public. Uh, Susan, uh, we just yeah. we just see that you started screen sharing, but we don't see your screen. Can't see the, oh, okay. Um, I thought it was shared. You may want to start hey, again. Uh, I'll tell you what, this is taking, mm -hmm. taking other people's time and that's not a good thing. So I'll just read it so you can disable it back again. Um, I also seem to be frozen. Am oh. I frozen? Hello. Hello. No, we we see you. Okay. But you, you will have to do stop sharing. Okay. First. Mm -hmm. On your side. Okay, it's frozen for some reason. But in any case, I, I just want to talk about the things that it doesn't include. So as I said, it doesn't include uh, the dual nature of data. It doesn't address what I call the data cartels, which are companies that are so big that they have a We seem to have lost Susan. Um... Have a responsibility to help developing countries grow with data, then it doesn't address the opacity of data markets. And uh, someone can ask me why I think trade agreements uh, should include those things, but I do think data is something different. And when we're talking about digital trade, we have to understand that data is not the same thing as uh, Susan, we. You're frozen. From a commercial transaction. Susan, we missed your sentence. You were frozen. Maybe you can turn off your screen. Maybe it's taking. Yeah, I did. Time. It's no longer uh, sharing. Uh, but the background may take some of the bandwidth. I'm not sure. Okay. So you want me to repeat what I just said? Yeah, the last sentence we missed. Okay. So, like I was saying, it doesn't address all these problems including the fact that data is exchanged across borders, but it's not always accompanied by a commercial transaction. So maybe, you know, because data is so different from traditional goods and services, maybe this is not the best place to govern it. It certainly was the easiest place. Great. Very interesting. Very uh, stimulating. So I'm turning next to... Uh... KS Park, uh, how do you evaluate data governance on a scale from one to 10? Uh, I also give uh, a very low score, um, probably um, two or three. Um, I think, uh, uh, and it's getting worse. Hmm. Um, I named this phenomenon, uh, Rafication of data, uh, rafication, um, you know, being made real. Um, data uh, is, uh, uh, in my definition, it's a relationship between sentient beings and the objects sensed. Um, and it's the knowledge of the world external to the consciousness of that sentient being. That's what data is. Um, with that definition, transfer of data is speech and collection of data is learning. Um, and restriction on transfer of data is a restriction on speech or freedom of speech. And restriction on collection of data becomes a restriction on learning or freedom to learn. Now, um, these days, uh, data is being treated as if it is a tangible thing, uh, as if uh, it can be uh, controlled by people uh, featured in the data uh, or owned by people producing that data. When, I mean, with the production, I'll, I'll put it in the, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll put in the bracket because um, 
when you are producing data, what you're really doing is you are uh, recording what you are sensing. And also data is being considered uh, something that needs uh, money, resources for delivery. Um, I mean, with, with this third uh, phenomenon, I'm uh, referring to the European Commission's uh, recent um, uh, recent su suggestion of a fair share deal. Um, and this uh, idea that data is uh, deemed uh, or data is capable of being owned by someone or can be charged for delivery uh, is, uh, it, it, it's causing, um, causing a, a secondary effect, which is that many countries are trying to uh, build their governance around the concept of uh, uh, data sovereignty. And the, uh, the US uh, is, uh, uh, the US who has uh, uh, sponsored the movement for free flow of data act is actually uh, making the problem worse. For instance, um, ma making it worse by uh, responding uh, in kind to the other uh, countries uh, use of uh, uh, this uh, concept of data as something real, something to be owned. Uh, the Chinese government has used the concept of data sovereignty uh, ostensibly to protect its own citizens from uh, harmful data. And European, European governments have seen GDPR as protecting uh, not just privacy, but European economic assets um, in a data that can be owned. Now, these are, um, and when the US is uh, uh, responding, uh, well, I mean, this, with, with these thoughts, with these thoughts, ignoring the fact that, uh, ignoring the fact that restriction on transfer of data is a uh, uh, restriction on uh, free speech and other human rights, um, much of uh, uh, data sovereignty is, uh, operationalized by uh, access bans on websites and apps, uh, not complying with the particular local data uh, restrictions, or sometimes by data localizations. And uh, one, you know, one bad example was uh, Trump's, uh, the former President Trump's proposal to kick TikTok off of the US soil. Uh, of course, it was triggered in part by the Chinese firewall, Chinese digital firewall first. Um, however, the US response, which was also sovereignty based, only hardened and justified the Chinese government's um, data sovereignty measure. And it will have a mutual escalation and it has uh, only grown. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean, I'm going to talk about uh, Korea soon, but uh, Korea adopted uh, the standard payroll in internet uh, interconnection, um, treating data delivery as uh, something to be charged. Um, and this proposal to charge the internet uh, has uh, uh, prompted, has stimulated a similar discussion in Europe which, which has already uh, dealt with it about 10 years ago. So uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, I think uh, um, I gave enough reason to give a low score on the uh, uh, international governance. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, KS. So now I'm turning to uh, Stephanie Honey. Uh, how do you score uh, you know, the, the overall global governance structure of data and digital flows? Uh, thanks very much, Eve, and uh, thank you also for the kind invitation to be part of this conversation. Um, I'd, I'd like to bring a bit of balance to the my my previous uh, fellow panelists. Uh, I think uh, you know you'd have to score 
uh, these, these participants in the global economy a little bit more highly on enthusiasm for governance structures um, because, uh, you know, one of the features of the, the global digital economy that we're seeing increasingly is people are regulating. So I think it's around half of FTAs have at least some sort of digital um, or e-commerce governance provisions in them. About 100 of them, of sort of around 380 in total, have dedicated chapters. Um, we've got a lot of uh, the participants in the WTO uh, are jo have joined this WTO e-commerce joint initiative, a sort of plurilateral negotiation on, on digital governance. Um, and we've also got massive regulatory overdrive uh, within economies. So um, I think some recent figures released by Simon Evanet of the um, Global Trade Alert, his, his digital policy alert, um, found that there were nearly 2,400 uh, regulatory interventions or steps taken by the EU, the G20 and China since the pandemic started. So I think if we wanted to give them a, a passing grade on enthusiasm for regulating, we could certainly do that. But where I, I guess I move a little bit more closely towards um, the, the other previous two panellists is what does it actually mean for global digital trade and business? And there I, I am a little more pessimistic because unfortunately this very fragmented, disjointed sort of patchwork of regulations really works against realising the promise of the digital economy. Uh, whether you're a small business or a developing economy or even you know, a large corporate or a, a large advanced economy, um, this global fragmentation of data governance and digital trade governance is a real problem. Um, what we really need is for um, data to flow freely, but with, with you know, sufficient safeguards to address those important concerns that, that um, Susan and KS have talked about around whether it's uh, you know, freedom of speech or, or personal privacy or you know, um, other legitimate public policy goals. So I think um, you know, overall I'd probably score about a, a four or a five. I think there is a lot of energy going into trying to address that issue. You know, we do have the WTO process. We've got a lot of um, large either um, sort of clubs or blocks um, partnerships in the digital economy where countries are trying to come together and develop greater coherence. Um, but so far that's been a lot of um, a lot of energy without a lot of coherence as a result of it. And uh, I, you know I think we're going to discuss later in the webinar how important that is. Um, I think you know whether you're measuring it in terms of uh, you know economic resilience after the pandemic, uh, inclusive growth, um, you know, advancing economic development or, you know, simply the interests of a, a, of a small uh, company in the global economy, that, that fragmentation is a problem and we need to address it. So let me leave it there. Um, there's a lot more to be said, but um, I'll pass to uh, the, the rest of the panel. Thanks. Wonderful comments and very interesting uh, separation between enthusiasm and then effectiveness. Uh, so I'm now turning to uh, Professor Henry Gao. What do you think? What's your evaluation? Thank you, Yves. Uh, it's my pleasure to join this panel. Now, uh, I actually share uh, many of the sentiments uh, expressed uh, by my distinguished uh, co-panelists uh, before, but the good news is that um, uh, actually I'm a bit more lenient in terms of marking because this is uh, uh, right in the middle of the market season, you know, marking exam papers. So I guess my students uh, who might be in the audience uh, might be happy to hear that. So instead of uh, three uh, or four like Kiers or uh, four or five like Stephanie, I would give it a six. That is, uh, uh, you know, it's a parsing mark. Um, uh, uh, I, I think the current system works uh, barely fine for the minimum level of global data flow that is needed to get things done. But uh, like, uh, uh, again, everybody has said, there are many problems in the governance structure. So uh, if you look around, you can see that there are not really uh, common rules, universal rules on data flow or uh, on allowed exceptions on data flow uh, because the different countries tend to emphasize different things. For example, the EU has been emphasizing, you know, broad data uh, flow restrictions based on privacy grounds, while China uh, is also uh, doing essentially the same, but on uh, national security grounds. 
So I, I think uh, the problem uh, with the current regime is that if this is not handled well, we might uh, run into three competing data blocks, which um, actually Susan has written about uh, uh, before. So um, I, I think uh, definitely there is a, a, a need uh, to uh, try to uh, work out some a sort of a global governance structure, as you uh, uh, correctly pointed out in the question, Eves. And I uh, echo uh, Stephanie's um, uh, 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 praise for the international community to try to work out, you know, a kind of a, a solution to get this going. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And then last but not least, I'm turning to Professor Masahiro Kawai. What is your view of the current okay. <laughs> global yeah. governance uh, of data? <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very uh, important and interesting uh, conversation. Um, I, uh, I would compare data governance with uh, other types of economic uh, governance. Uh, I don't know if uh, people agree with uh, my assessment. How do you evaluate uh, WTO? Uh, maybe I would give a score of uh, three or something today. Uh, uh, IMF, um, you know, money and finance governance uh, 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 sent out by uh, the IMF, DIS. I would give uh, a score of uh, maybe seven or so. Uh, they try to manage uh, stability uh, uh, and they, they try to come up with uh, universally acceptable uh, way of regulating uh, the industry uh, and at the same time uh, promoting uh, you know, uh, freer uh, flows of uh, money and, and, and capital. Uh, 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 development uh, issue, uh, ADB, uh, the World Bank, uh, uh, regional, regional development banks. I think uh, they have been uh, uh, relatively more successful. I would give uh, the score of eight to them. You know, no institution uh, can be perfect. Now, data governance, there is no kind of in international institution that governs global uh, data issues. Uh, uh, but, but at the same time, uh, there are uh, uh, various attempts to uh, uh, come up with uh, uh, some common rules, rules among a select group of countries. Uh, well, uh, WTO, as uh, Somebody said uh, is trying to uh, work on uh, e-commerce, um, uh, regional uh, trade agreements, or, or purely, purely lateral or bilateral trade agreements, economic partnership agreements, or, or, or digital economy uh, uh, agreements. Uh, they they are now uh, trying to come up with uh, 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 introducing uh, some common rules. So, so it's not, uh, my score is not one or two, maybe I would give, uh, you know, three or four, uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe comparable to the current uh, WTO situation, which is, uh, which is kind of uh, disappointing in the case of the WTO. Now, uh, data governance, uh, 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 the global community, uh, many countries are trying to come up with uh, some common common rules, uh, which is uh, which is encouraging. So, so I, I would I you know uh, I would take a position uh, uh, closer to uh, Henry and and Stephanie. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So that was fascinating. Quite the spectrum here. Um, but on the whole, a bit of optimism, a bit of resilience, at least in what we got. So I'm now turning to a second question and I'll probably will go in reverse order. And the second question is simpler. What do you think are the most essential pillars that regulate global data and digital flows now, uh, including global, regional, club-like or whatever? Uh, so if you want to name two or three, what are the most essential pieces that are holding the system together in digital governance? 
and I'll go in reverse order. So I'll start with uh, Masahiro san. Okay, okay. I I would say uh, uh, a free flow of uh, data with trust. Uh, it, uh, this is something that uh, the Japanese government uh, uh, is promoting, uh, starting from uh, the G20 Osaka summit in 2019. Uh, we want to see uh, free or freer flows of data, but at the same time protecting uh, uh, personal uh, uh, personal information and privacy. And uh, we need an institutional framework that would uh, enable uh, uh, people to have uh, trust uh, in, uh, in the uh, uh, governance framework. So, so I, I think uh, that's the most important, uh, important pillar. Uh, just I, I talked about uh, personal information. Now, uh, there are many different uh, types of data. There are data on people, there are data on things, and data uh, data on things uh, should be uh, should be uh, promoted uh, uh, more vigor vigorously. Uh, uh, an example is that uh, uh, Japanese multinational companies, manufacturing firms, are operating globally and they want to collect data from all over the world uh, from factories uh, operating in Vietnam, uh, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, in Europe, uh, United States, and uh, these uh, data flows on products, uh, you know, uh, on how uh, factories are, fun are working, machines are working, uh, these data, uh, essentially uh, industrial data and uh, such uh, uh, data free flow uh, should be uh, much more vigorously promoted and it could be promoted and uh, uh, and and uh, so so uh, I, I just wanted to separate uh, you know two different types of data uh, the most sensitive part is on personal personal information. Thank you. Thank you. So Henry, of, of all the arrangements that you have written about, you know, from DIPA to TPP, now we have Quad, we have IPEF, we have so many things, and then global things, WTO, what, which are the pillars that you find most important, most innovative, that carry the most uh, uh, hope, right, in, in uh, managing governing data? Mm. Thank you, Yves. Uh, I will start with the global arrangement. Uh, that is the WTO Ministerial Declaration on Global E-Commerce, mm -hmm. uh, which even though, you know, is um, uh, not um, uh, very uh, complete, but at least it provides the uh, moratorium on customer duties on e-commerce, uh, and that is uh, very important. And that is the only global rules that we have now. Then at the regional level, I will see uh, it is the CPTPP and RCEP, CPTPP basically provide a kind of a model uh, for uh, data uh, regulation and the data flow uh, between largely advanced economies. While the RCEP provide another model that is, uh, uh, you know, how do you work out uh, the data flow arrangement between advanced economies and the developing countries, especially with a country like China that has many data flow restrictions. Uh, and also, I would add at the end that uh, we also have the DIPA, uh, which uh, Singapore, you know, is uh, one of the main driving force behind it. Uh, so the DIPA provide a very interesting model for future types of uh, data uh, or digital trade agreements uh, that might inspire other countries to uh, uh, look into the future of global uh, data flow uh, governance. Thank you. Great. And um, well, I have the same question for Stephanie now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Well, it's always uh, you know very hard to follow Henry. He's uh, you know an absolute uh, you know guru on all of these uh, topics, and and of course I can't disagree with anything he said. Um, I would fully endorse that. But I think it's also worth reflecting on um, uh, you know sometimes these pillars actually can serve different and important purposes. I mean, your, your question was around 
uh, you know, what, what serves our, our needs to regulate right now. And uh, obviously, as Henry says, you know, we've got these um, very important, highly ambitious, uh, you know, uh, FTAs like CPTPP. Um, but I do think that uh, some of the other fora or platforms that have been created to engage on these issues are also very important. I mean, one of the interesting features of the digital economy is that I think if you took a random sample of trade experts, most people would feel very comfortable in, in uh, their, their understanding of how goods trades works or even how services trade works. But, you know, in the digital economy, there's a lot that we don't actually fully understand, whether you're looking at it through the lens of what are the economic implications or the legal or the regulatory implications, the social implications um, of a lot of these new models of business, but also new models of regulation. So I think... Uh, the, the pillars, if you like, that, that provide a platform to engage on, on these issues and essentially share learning and uh, sort of co-design response of an agile regulation are really important. So in that context, I, I strongly agree with Henry that DEPA um, is, a, is a really important model. Uh, you know, it's designed as a building block, as an open uh, sort of platform for countries to join to work on this rapidly evolving policy space. And so I think in that sense, it has an advantage over some of these other very ambitious, you know, innovative digital agreements or e-commerce chapters, because on the whole, they are rather a closed set. Uh, you know, the, the two or three or five or 10 participants in those agreements have come up with some ideas, but, um, you know, it's not open to others to join. So I think in that sense, the DEEP is really important. I'm interested in what the US is doing with the IPEF. Um, you know, there are a lot, lot of things you can criticize about the IPEF, but I think if you look at it purely from the digital perspective, it also creates this quite useful platform for a, a group of countries to, to look at, um, perhaps slightly less open than DEEPA, but, you know, the potential is there. Um, but I do also think some of the other sort of regional fora are also very useful. And in that connection, um, I do a lot of work in the APEC space, um, particularly in the, the business arm of APEC, the APEC Business Advisory Council. And I think there's huge unrealized potential in that forum because, of course, it brings together advanced economies in the Asia Pacific, but also a lot of developing economies um, to have these conversations. A lot of the members of APEC are some of the real thought leaders in the region on these digital economy issues, whether, you know, from Southeast Asia or North America, New Zealand, of course. Um, so, you know, I think that's also an area where under the US chairmanship next year, I would love to see some real um, energy injected into that context as well uh, to really... Um, deepen the sort of shared understanding about how we regulate effectively to achieve the range of goals that, that the countries have in the region for this part of the economy. Thanks. Wonderful. Very interesting. Um, KS, what do I, you think? I think uh, this uh, uh, regional uh, rulemaking uh, will be uh, beneficial um, however, it's uh, um, important that it remains uh, inclusive and open uh, and the standard of uh, uh, joining be made uh, uh, transparent um, because, uh, as I said in my opening remark, uh, escalation uh, is a uh, an issue, uh, escalation is a phenomenon that you want to avoid. If you build a uh, closed uh, economic or geopolitical or digital block with uh, like-minded countries, uh, that can sometimes present itself as a threat to the countries that have not joined. Um, and uh, only when that arrangement, uh, IPF or DEPA, uh, is uh, uh, inclusive and transparent and open, uh, then uh, it can, uh, it has the potential of uh, uh, opening up uh, other countries' uh, borders uh, as well to expand the uh, digital uh, economy. Uh, one, one, I'm not going to 
you know, I'm not gonna all praise about it, but um, the European Union um, uh, has a GDPR uh, that has interesting relations with the digital economy. Um, this year issued an adequacy decision uh, for South Korea uh, so that South Korean businesses, uh, South Korean digital businesses uh, can uh, host um, uh, European uh, data. Um, so that adequacy decision process uh, could have been more open, more transparent. Um, however, uh, the fact that they opened what was essentially a uh, regional arrangement to uh, non-EU uh, countries uh, shows that uh, shows the potential of uh, uh, becoming one of the building blocks of uh, global uh, governance norms for um, digital trade and digital um, digital uh, freedom of speech. Um, and in doing so, in, in, in making sure that these uh, regional blocks uh, do not uh, fall into um, escalation where you know, other countries uh, form their own block uh, in competition uh, with or in uh, confrontation with the existing blocks uh, is that we focus on uh, some of the uh, global norms, the, the pre-existing uh, global norms uh, that could uh, act uh, as a, a guidance. Uh, for instance, uh, international human rights is uh, one theme by which we can uh, guide our discussions on uh, digital trade. Um, and on the other side, uh, for instance, uh, Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, uh, it, it has done uh, a reasonable job of uh, attracting um, a fair number of uh, uh, participants um, that uh, basically uh, restored trust on the internet uh, while uh, preserving uh, privacy and uh, free flow of uh, uh, data. Um, so uh, these um, global, so these regional attempts have to be always uh, global, we should be looking toward the uh, global goal or toward a globalization um, so that uh, it doesn't uh, fall into the mutual escalation that we see between the US and uh, China um, that is only uh, heightening uh, the uh, wars between them. Well, you gave us a lot here to, uh, to work with. Thank you, KS. And uh, Susan is gonna bring all this together now. What are your views? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I fundamentally disagree with almost everybody here. I guess I'm the flames thrower. But basically, since the internet is global, the rules should be global as well, because we're talking about the free flow of data among nations. When you said pillars, I didn't think of it as, gee, is DEA better than uh, DEPA or is the WTO, what we know of the e-commerce agreement, better than what USMCA says about data. What I saw it as, is there a mismatch between what data is and trade? And so what are the pillars of that? And so as Makashiro said, um, the pillar should be free flow with trust. Okay, but in a trade agreement, the norms are non, discrimination, right, and market access. Those are the key norms. And so you see a discussion of non-discrimination, certainly, um, because many of these trade agreements discuss things like no performance requirement. okay? Um, so you don't have to reveal source code, which means, um, you know, the underlying algorithm, let's say, 
as a key condition of, of being in that country. But what they don't discuss adequately is market access for data. And the fact is that many members of the WTO shut off their internet, other members, which has huge implications for market access around the world. India, I'm looking at you, um, Ethiopia, Iran, et cetera. Um, all nations censor to some degree. It is normative and it's perfectly allowable under the exceptions. But the exceptions, that is how we have gone with this. There aren't enough trade disputes to understand how and when you can use the ex exceptions. We have not done real rules based on trade pillars. And that's, again, sorry to be boring, but I think it is because data really doesn't completely match the trade system. I yearn that it could, but I think we're all being dishonest about this. I'll shut up now. Very provocative. Thank you for those wonderful comments. Uh, <laughs> You're so <talking>. I have... <laughs> I have a third question, which uh, I think it's an even bigger one. Uh, I'll call it the elephant in the room. Um, and here it goes. Data ownership and data control is now seen as a critical, you know, critical ingredient for AI development, artificial intelligence. And that's partly for those reasons that India, Indonesia, and South Africa refuse to sign the Osaka G20 Data Free Flow with Trust Declaration, uh, you know, is concerned that data ownership um, and, um, you know, if they did not have data control and did not have infant industry protection, all that data would be controlled by, you know, the big four American companies, maybe the Chinese, and they would not be available for AI development in India, Indonesia, South Africa, and for other things as well. Uh, the EU itself is waking up to the fact that it doesn't control much of the data produced in the EU, except for GDPR restrictions on privacy. Uh, and in Canada, Jim Berzilli has been raising a similar alarm. What can be done to reach a governance agreement on data ownership and free flow that addresses the quasi-monopoly situation of the first, uh, the, the first movers that control so much of the data and then have a huge competitive advantage in AI. So uh, I'll go from the middle this time. So maybe start with Stephanie and then do some kind of random. <laughs> uh, well, thanks very much, Eve. Um, I, I thought it might be quite a nice gimmick actually to ask GTP chat uh, to develop a response, um, and I, I, I did in fact uh, plug a question in, and uh, I, you'll be pleased to hear that AI was able to deliver a very good answer, which touched on the importance of uh, policies to promote competition, uh, antitrust laws, data portability regulations and privacy protection, um, development of, of models that give people more control over their own data and, and so on. I, I won't read out the whole thing, but I think we can we can understand that this is incredibly sort of powerful, not for the future, but you know, I mean, it's here now. AI is, is clearly um, going to be a huge feature of the sort of modern modern digital economy and, and the, the trade landscape as well. Um, but just to pick up on a couple of the points that you, you'd uh, gone through in your question, I think it's really the wrong framing um, to look at this in terms of um, how do, for example, developing countries control data um, to enhance their AI development or otherwise. I mean, there's been so much research that's been done about the shortcomings of, of policies that essentially seek to uh, keep a, a tight grip on data flows, including, you know, data localization and, and um, related measures. Whether you're looking at it in terms of, uh, you know, the overall impact on GDP growth or inclusion. Um, you know, I mean, there are some really important questions for developing countries in the digital economy, but I think a philosophy that says I need to control the data to achieve the, the economic potential of the digital economy is just the wrong way of going about it. I mean, that said, I do think there's a really big, another elephant in the room, which is how do we help developing economies 
to participate successfully. I mean, it's not just a question of how do they design a good, uh, you know, digital trade regime. It's do they even have the fundamental building blocks of digital economy regulation, whether it's an electronic transmissions framework or, or data protection regulation, let alone the host of other sort of enabling regulatory measures that are needed, uh, you know, uh, around um, sort of privacy or digital identities or regulatory sandboxes or whatever it might be. So, I, I, you know, I think that's a critical element in this. And perhaps if that were better addressed, it might take some of the heat out of these issues around sort of data sovereignty and, and who gets to control it. Um, but as, as for, uh, you know, how do we ensure that we address the, the sort of the competition aspects of digital um, of data? You know, that's really difficult and it's something that I think will become an increasingly prominent aspect of, of digital trade discourse. It's not something that almost any, uh, even of these most innovative cutting edge digital economy agreements have looked at. Um, you know, there are there are kind of allusions to it in, in Deeper and others, but it's really not, not up there. Um, or things like consumer data rights, which a number of economies are starting to develop, but really haven't found their way into this sort of cross-border space as well. So it's a very important issue. It's something that actually the conversation needs to come on to, but that's why I think some of those, those more sort of platform-based approaches where there can be an evolving dialogue are really important for that. And, you know, maybe we'll see something on that in IPEF, for example. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Eve. Very good. So thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I'll turn to Henry next, if okay. <laughs> Thank you, Yves. Uh, I feel that uh, I have something to say on this topic uh, because uh, I'm the only person on the panel who has the experience of actually living in a communist country for uh, 20 years. So I would say uh, that uh, I'm less concerned with ownership because any ownership arrangement that comes out of this is unlikely to be individual ownership because it will be too uh, unwieldy to actually work. Instead, it is going to be a collective ownership, but collective ownership as communism has illustrated is also uh, highly unlikely to work. So uh, I, I guess I would be more concerned with whether the people can really benefit from the data owned by the big firms. I mean, even if the uh, big firms uh, uh, own the data, but if the people can have the access to the data when needed, and uh, if the government or maybe some civil society groups can uh, have access to this data on their behalf for the collective good, I guess uh, that would be good enough for me. So I, I think any future governance agreement would need to um, address the issue of a fundamental data access rights for the people, and maybe also for the government and civil society groups on their behalf, to have access to such data when needed for legitimate public or personal use. And here, I guess we can borrow from the um, uh, example, uh, the precedent uh, set by the USMCA, where if you look at uh, the issue of uh, uh, access to financial data, because uh, compared to the CPTPP, in the CPTPP, actually they had a, a carve out for data localization requirements. Uh, for the financial data because the U.S. Fed uh, Reserve was concerned, uh, you know, about uh, regulatory issues. So they were unwilling to allow offshore storage of data. But this issue was uh, uh, solved in the U.S. MCA, where uh, according to the new agreement, uh, they uh, said if you have, uh, you know, direct, immediate and uh, uh, unhindered access to data, that would be good enough for the regulator. So I guess that could be an interesting model when we talk about, you know, the ownership or the access to data in such future agreements. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you, Henry. Uh, so next, maybe Susan, what do you think? Oh, you're muted, I think. Susan, you're still muted. Problems with Zoom tonight. Okay, a couple of points. Um, I think AI is changing significantly, and I think these are important problems that we need to address. But I, I also think um, AI, we're moving towards an approach to AI that uses synthetic data or less data. And so I think the whole vision of 
data economies of scale and scope, while it's very, very important, and it's, that is what leads um, analysts to believe that China, because it has such a huge population and so much personal data, China has this great potential. I'm not saying it doesn't, but these economies of scale and scope based on the population amounts of data, et cetera, I think that is going to change over time. And that has real implications for how nations see it. Right now, nations see data as a sovereign asset. I did a paper for CG a while back, which looked at which countries have data strategies. Right now, there are 14. And of those countries, and what I mean by data strategy is a national statement that says the role of data in the economy and polity. Okay, that's thing one. And almost all of those countries said data was sovereign. But that's kind of insane because data is not just a, a commercial asset to be used in one country. It is a global public good. And as a public good, you and I don't know the potential of data. Most people are not trained to understand the potential uses of data. And I don't know how to train them. But what I'm saying is that the future of data for AI, et cetera, will be through data sharing and effective anonymization and effective data protection. It will not be through these large pools of data. Those will remain important, but what is most important is that society realizes this dual simultaneous nature of data, again, being a commercial asset and a, and a quasi public good or a public good. And so I do think that right now we have a vision of data as it is fuel for AI. But what I hope to see over time is a vision of data as this multidimensional thing that can help nations solve wicked problems, that can help nations uh, learn how to encourage sectors that are um, slowing, um, you know, that is essential to all parts of the economy and the polity. It's essential to good governance, right? It's essential to accountability. It's essential to competition, the things that we want to regulate in society. And I just think, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I, we have this vision of data almost always only as a commercial asset and almost always as something that should be sovereign. It should be controlled by the people living in that country. The problem with that, again, to be boring, is that it ignores the dual nature of data and its potential, which is really hard to understand. I don't understand it, but I can tell you that it is there. You and I don't know the potential value of TikTok's data. <laughs> The Chinese government thinks it does, though, right? And that is personal data. But when you mix personal data with other types of data, there's all sorts of new insights that may that scholars may find. Thanks. Fascinating. Great. Um, Masahiro-san, what do you think? OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, uh, clearly, uh, international cooperation is needed. Uh, uh, to reach a governance agreement on data uh, ownership and uh, uh, and uh, free uh, free flow, um, uh, but but uh, to do so, to to have an effective international cooperation, a convergence of uh, national laws on personal uh, information protection and data. Uh, flows uh, would be would be required. Uh, uh, just say uh, uh, you know uh, for your information, uh, Japan uh, revised the Act on protecting personal information, uh, uh, and uh, this uh, revised uh, Act was implemented uh, in April this year. Uh, this uh, revised Act requires firms to treat personal information in a more stringent and careful way. So now uh, Japanese uh, firms and, and also foreign firms uh, that try to transfer or acquire uh, data uh, uh, 
uh, would have to pay a lot of attention to uh, what types of uh, countries uh, can personal data be transferred to. Uh, uh, those countries uh, have to have a system for the protection of personal information. Uh, those countries uh, uh, should have uh, requirements uh, stating that uh, personal information must be used within the scope of the use purpose specified in advance. And those countries must allow individuals to exercise the right to request disclosure of personal information uh, held by the business operator. Uh, those countries uh, cannot, those countries' governments cannot, should not see the transferred personal information. And those countries uh, uh, must allow individuals in question to request for information deletion. And uh, those countries' business operators who are potential recipients of data uh, uh, must announce the purpose of use in advance. And those countries uh, uh, should take measures to comply with uh, the eight principles of the OECD uh, privacy guidelines. So uh, uh, basically, you know, uh, once many countries adopt, uh, you know, similar, uh, similar laws, uh, uh, it would be much easier to come up with a more concerted uh, kind of uh, uh, approach. Uh, of course, uh, we know that uh, different countries have uh, different, uh, different laws. No, so how, how do we go about it? I, I agree with uh, Stephanie, uh, who emphasized uh, the importance of APEC. Uh, APEC has its own uh, cross-border uh, privacy uh, uh, rules. And uh, I think it would be useful uh, for the APEC countries, for example, to get together to discuss uh, their own national laws on uh, data protection, uh, data flows, uh, uh, and you know, uh, improve transparency, what they have in their own systems, and accountability also. Uh, they have to explain why you know, uh, such, uh, such, such laws are in, in place. And then mutual discussion, uh, much like uh, uh, OECD kind of peer review process, uh, rather, than, rather than criticizing other countries, but uh, trying to understand with each other among countries so that, uh, you know, uh, over time, uh, more, you know, greater convergence uh, uh, in uh, national, uh, national uh, laws and regulation rules uh, would, uh, would take place. That, that's something, uh, you know, I, I want to suggest. And the same thing could apply to, uh, uh, to the approach to AI and, and also to the approach uh, to uh, regulating uh, uh, you know, digital platforms, you know, large digital platforms, uh, which could exercise uh, quasi monopoly power in the data uh, market. Thank you. Great. Well, the regulation of quasi-monopoly power of big platform is not an easy topic, right? That's, that's one of EU-US tensions, as we know. But uh, I'm going to now turn to KS for uh, the wrap up on this question before turning to individual questions from the audience and, uh, and more. Yeah. KS, it's yours. I think uh, the concept of data ownership uh, is uh, uh, not sustainable um, because uh, as I said, uh, data is uh, knowledge. And uh, when we say um, data ownership, I mean, when, um, when for instance, an automobile maker does a lot, of a lot of research and finds useful information about making car. Um, we protect that data. We protect the result of research as a, a trade secret. Um, 
but when uh, digital platform companies um, use uh, use the uh, data um, gathered through their uh, platform and uh, use that to uh, uh, obtain uh, useful insights about, uh, for instance, uh, in a uh, uh, epidemic of uh, influenza, um, we uh, are complaining about uh, data monopoly. Now, um, I think that um, there is a, um, there has to be uh, antitrust regulation of uh, big platforms uh, from economic uh, perspective. Um, however, that has to be uh, separated from the regulation of uh, uh, collection and uh, use of data. Um, I think that um, a lot of uh, reasons, uh, a lot of uh, uh, reasons that we are uh, concerned about uh, data monopoly uh, coming from uh, data, uh, data monopoly of our platform companies is because much of data uh, comes from the users of the platforms. Uh, but much of that can be addressed by data protection law. Uh, that concerns personal data. Um, data portability is uh, one strong right. I mean, I call that you know, data access right plus. Uh, that can be, uh, that can restore uh, control or you know, right to profit from uh, data uh, that uh, people have uh, uh, contributed. Uh, to uh, the uh, the research uh, being done at the uh, platforms. Um, so we already have a very good tool, uh, data protection law, that uh, does uh, give back the uh, rights of uh, uh, data subjects. The, give give uh, uh, part of the part of the value created by data gathering back to the data subject. Now, outside uh, personal data, uh, it is uh, difficult to um, restrict uh, data flow. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to conceptualize or difficult to justify uh, uh, restriction on data flow, data collection, or learning, uh, and uh, all of that. Um, because, uh, as I said in the beginning of this remark, that it's difficult to distinguish trade secret, uh, and uh, it's, it's 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 difficult to distinguish trade secret of uh, brick and mortar companies, and uh, the use of uh, uh, anonymized data, uh, the use of uh, anonymous data by the uh, uh, platform platform companies. Um, again, I'm distinguishing between personal data and non-personal data and making this data ownership uh, focused restrictions that are uh, hampering collection, use, and reuse, and research on non-personal data will only uh, hamper um, the digital economy will hamper the sharing of uh, the knowledge uh, from those uh, uh, research efforts. Um, as you can see, it's getting dark. I made a, um, a miscalculation about uh, my uh, location. So I, I'll be listening in, but uh, I'll be off uh, just for 10 minutes to move my place to a lighter location. But uh, I'll, 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 I'll remain on, listening on the conversation. And when it's, when it's my turn, I'll be in a, a lighter setting. All right. Thank you very much, KS. No problem with that. That's great. You're with us. Uh, all right. So we're going to now bring some questions uh, from the audience. 
uh, as well as an additional one for each person. But so for each of you, I'll give you a bundle of two, three questions and you have a maximum of two to three minutes because we have 15 minutes total for this portion. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll start with uh, Susan. Two questions came for you. One from an anonymous attendee uh, who asked, you said that governments don't understand what data is and that it's multidimensional. How do you define data and what is the most productive way to think about it? So that's the first question. Uh, there's a second one from Won Hyuk Lim at KDI, um, and he's asking, if you see data as a global public good, would you require firms that collect data to put anonymized data in public repository with open access for everyone who meets some qualification criteria? And if you wish, if you still have <laughs> a little bit of time, you could also tell us more about your hub's global data governance mapping project and how you collect the data for it and maybe the key findings emerging from it. Lots for you. Okay, <laughs> okay. let me just start with that, which is basically um, <laughs> um, we have a methodology that was based on the World Bank survey of, of data governance. Um, we went to the OECD, to the World Bank, to many other sources of what is governance, good governance, to come up with that methodology, give us feedback. We're constantly rethinking of it. We have six attributes of what we consider good governance to be, and those attributes um, are essentially strategies. So does the government have um, a data strategy, an AI strategy? Um, I'm just listing some of them. There's six attributes and 26 indicators. I won't go through all the indicators. We only check off if it exists. We don't do an assessment of how good or bad it is. We're, we're trying to make this as objective and, and non-normative as possible. But of course, a Western bias does come in to some extent. But what we do is every year, we assess based on those six attributes. So again, the attributes, which I didn't list, I only did one strategies for data, for AI, starting to have XR, et cetera. Um, laws and regulations for the protection of personal, proprietary, public data. Then has governance uh, structures changed as a result of data? So for example, digital trade attaches, data protection bodies. Fourth, um, we look at ethical human rights uh, responsible strategies. Has the government adopted any of those ones? Fifth, public participation in the governance of data. So for example, does the government create an advisory board? Who's on that advisory board? Does the government seek public comments related to data, to AI, to other data-driven sectors? And finally, what are they doing internationally? So as KS said, like the Budapest Cyber Convention, are they part of G? Uh, OECD AI, the global principles on AI, et cetera. So, um, okay, to answer the question, what is data? So right now I'm really talking about machine readable data, zeros and ones, as opposed to data that you might use from a survey. Uh, so it's you can express it in zeros and ones. That's what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about when individuals, governments, firms collect this type of machine readable data. But the multidimensionality comes in, um, in that that data generally more and more, right? Google says its mission is to collect and improve the world's uh, data information. And I worry that um, as we've all talked about that more and more firms control data that they hold, which is includes public data, personal data, proprietary data, satellite data, et cetera. They're collecting, because they're analyzing it under algorithms, they're getting control over more and more of that data. And at the same time, we really don't understand. I, I said this already, so forgive me for being redundant. We really don't understand how that data might be used to solve public health problems, to address global warming, et cetera. And no firm knows the potential uses of the data. They have data stewards who supposedly say 
here's how we can anonymize and share various types of data. So what I would suggest is we create an international organization that data from firms. We need to pay them for the data that they control. We need to incentivize them to share data. Data sharing is hard. People have to believe that the platform effectively anonymizes and protects personal data, uh, effectively protects proprietary data or business confidential data. This is not easy to do. So that's why I'm saying, um, let's try to come up with incentives instead of regulations. I have a paper coming out on that. It'll be out soon. It's called, It's about a wicked problems agency and what that could do globally. Because I think um, right now, we're really torn in this world where nations, and I think this is perfectly understandable, nobody knows how to govern data really. We're all trying in different ways, um, but we're not really building trust. And you might ask, well, how do you know that? You don't know that because trust can't be measured. But I think you do see it in people's behavior and their concerns about data. And they're pleased that their data be effectively anonymized and protected. Thank you. Wow, thank you. You managed to cover all those questions in one go. That's very, very impressive. Um, so next, uh, turning to, uh, to Henry. Uh, so there is a good question for you from an anonymous attendee. Can you explain more about DIPA and how it functions? And then I'll add uh, a second question for you. How worried are Singapore and ASEAN about the fragmentation of data governance? Um, and what are the expectations about DIPA? What are the most positive trends you see in the region? Uh, and, you know, basically ASEAN Singapore uh, are at the front, on the front line of finding ways to coexist, right, between China and the West. So is there anything emerging in terms of coexistent rules between China and, uh, and Western, uh, uh, Western nations? Thank you, Yves, and uh, thanks for the anonymous question. I will address the fragmentation problem first, and then I will touch on uh, DIPA. So uh, on fragmentation, I don't think it's uh, deemed as a problem in ASEAN, uh, because uh, that is basically how ASEAN does things. If you look at the existing free trade agreement of ASEAN, you can see that uh, there have always been different layers of expectations when it comes to different uh, groups of countries, even within ASEAN. So typically in this uh, free trade agreement, you have the original ASEAN five countries uh, plus Brunei, which would be expected to assume higher levels of obligation, such as the more zero tariff coverage, shorter implementation period or immediate implementation. While the so-called CLV countries, uh, uh, that is, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, Laos, and Vietnam would have a less coverage of uh, 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 zero tariff and higher final bond tariff and also longer transition periods. It is also true in services where you can see, uh, for example, in the RCEP, which some uh, uh, of the uh, ASEAN countries assume obligations according to the uh, highest standard of negative listing approach, while the others would be according to the lowest standard of a positive listing scheduling approach. So uh, this is also reflected in the DIPA. So if you look at the DIPA, the DIPA, uh, the main innovations of the DIPA is that uh, first of all, it takes a, a modular approach and uh, this modular approach uh, include a total of um, 16 modules, but of the 16 there, are, uh, if you look at the substantive obligations, there are only about a dozen substantive obligations. And all of these are optional, uh, rather than uh, having a kind of a one size fits all approach. So uh, um, uh, that is uh, the main innovation of uh, uh, DIPA compared to the existing digital trade agreements. And of course, they also touch on new issues such as AI governance, such as uh, uh, you know, the government data issues and so on. So um, I, I personally think that uh, the DIPA uh, approach is really an interesting approach as uh, Stephanie has rightly pointed out before. And this uh, is really a positive trend because uh, first of all, it allows uh, the diversity of, pro uh, of approaches among its members. And second, uh, it um, uh, basically gives the uh, members the time to work out uh, the consensus first before making this abandoned commitment 
And this is done according to the ASEAN way, or uh, as Stephanie and uh, uh, Master Hiro Sang mentioned earlier, you know, the open regionalism approach uh, championed by APEC. So uh, that is a, a really interesting uh, model, I personally think. Um, uh, so this is the, the approach taken in the RCEP2, where if you look at the rules on uh, free flow of data and also data localization requirements, they were also non-banding and not subject to dispute settlement. And that is also the case under the DIPA. So I, I, I think uh, that shows, uh, you know, the way that people like to do things in this part of the world, that is, uh, we, we don't really rush to make banning commitments. Instead, we want to form, uh, you know, a consensus among the group, everybody to be uh, roughly on the same page before we uh, make this banning. And uh, maybe in the area of uh, digital trade and data governance, uh, this would be a, a kind of a more workable approach for the future. Thank you. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, so next, uh, I'll turn to Masahiro. Uh, and I have again two questions. You may want to address the question for Matthias Magulis first. Um, and you know, what is your thought on the digital trade security nexus in global governance, particularly in light of the escalating US China tensions and the weaponization of trade, for example, Russia on energy and grains, US on microchips, etc. Um, so th that's one. And then I have another question for you. Uh, but you have only one and a half minute, or maximum two minutes. How worried is Japan about the fragmentation of digital governance and the growing weaponization of data? Uh, and what is your hope on IPEC? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, this uh, uh, digital uh, uh, trade and security uh, nexus uh, becomes a very important uh, very important uh, uh, issue. Uh, this is something uh, something we have to confront. Uh, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, technology technology uh, uh, strategic competition between uh, the U.S. and China on technology, and also uh, uh, data uh, that that could easily spread. Uh, to, to data. I think uh, we need a lot of uh, conversations anyway, uh, anyway, uh, between, uh, between countries. Um, Japan is uh, very much worried about the fragmentation. As I said earlier, Japanese uh, enterprises operate globally and, and uh, Asia has a uh, uh, serious uh, uh, fragmentation uh, issue. Uh, Many companies go to China, operate there, and China's national intelligence law enacted uh, in uh, 2017 requires Chinese enterprises and individuals to cooperate with the authorities' intelligence activity. That, that gives kind of a, a, a sense of worry for many Japanese uh, firms. Uh, because uh, their business partners uh, may leak data, may go against uh, uh, Japanese companies' uh, uh, interests. Uh, to minimize uh, to minimize that, uh, a lot of uh, uh, protection measures uh, would be needed on the part of uh, Japanese enterprises, and uh, that would of course reduce uh, the extent of. Uh, uh, potential economic benefits uh, uh, coming uh, coming from uh, uh, Japan-China uh, economic uh, relationship. Um, j j just uh, one word on uh, uh, on uh, the Indo-Pacific economic uh, framework, which is going on. Uh, uh, that includes trade and digital trade rules. So, so, so you know, we want to see how far that would go because that includes uh, countries like Indonesia, uh, which, uh, which did, did not uh, come to the meeting on uh, data free flow with trust. So, so you know, uh, we want to see still things are, are evol evolving. Why not I just, just stop here? No. Great, yeah, thank you very much. So we're bumping into uh, the end of our time, but I um, 
I have a quick uh, question for Stephanie. Uh, from New Zealand's perspective, what are the most hopeful ways to overcome data fragmentation? And, um, and what do business and civil society think? Well, thanks very much, Eve. Uh, I think it's important to bring in that dimension of, uh, you know, what does business want? Because, of course, data governance is, is critical. It's the enabler. But there's a whole lot more in the digital economy that business actually needs to operate successfully. Essentially, you know, you need to enable an end-to-end -end digital trade transaction. So that isn't just about data flows, although that's critical. But it's also things like payments, it's about digital identities, if they're in the physical goods space, it's about, uh, you know, digital trade facilitation. Um, so I think, you know, the, the deeper model, maybe potentially the IPF model, is a way to address that sort of holistic need um, to sort of a, a create an enabling environment end to end for digital trade transactions. And I think another really important part of this conversation as well as about standards, essentially, how do we allow interoperability across these different models of digital economy regulation? And so standards is a really boring but important part of, of that. So I, I'd say, you know, again, coming back to, well, deeper is a really great starting point, but we need to bring in all these other com conversations about how to, to regulate um, digital trade as well um, and, and sort of integrate all of those learnings too. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. Finally, to KX, there are a couple uh, audience questions, uh, but you have only a minute or so, a minute and a half. Uh, how should we deal with the most vulnerable data? What is the best way to secure that? And then second, uh, you know, did the pandemic uh, have a big impact on uh, surveillance or the safety of data and, uh, you know, you know, in the context of Zuboff's book, right, Surveillance Capitalism, what do we learn from the pandemic period? Um, I take the, uh, uh, I think the first and second question are related because uh, um, some of the most vulnerable information is uh, uh, health data. Um, and as you know, uh, Korea um, is, uh, I thought was the only country that uh, instituted uh, uh, mandatory uh, non-consensual contact tracing. Um, uh, Israel did that for a few months, but uh, their constitutional court, uh, uh, their their highest highest court struck it down as unconstitutional. Um, I, I don't know what China uh, is doing, um, but I just came from a seminar with uh, um, uh, Taiwan uh, National Human Rights Commission, and they revealed to us they revealed to me that they have been doing non-consensual, when I say non-consensual, I'm talking about against the wills of the patients, uh, non-consensual location uh, tracking. So I, I was surprised, but um, this is all being done without any judicial oversight or other procedural safeguards. And uh, it has proven effective in um, mitigating uh, the uh, uh, pandemic, uh, but we should not, uh, just write it off as a cultural exception because uh, uh, Koreans are just as well concerned about their privacy. And yet uh, we have engaged in this, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 mandatory uh, use of uh, uh, really private data for uh, public uh, health uh, purposes. And uh, this will, um, I'm, I mean, I'm concerned that this may become a, a slippery slope uh, through which more and more uh, state surveillance will be allowed for uh, public purposes uh, against uh, wills of the uh, subjects uh, without any judicial oversight. I mean, a, a lot of mandatory uh, data acquisition does take place through uh, search and seizure by the prosecutors and police, but it's all done through uh, judicial uh, oversight. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm just as concerned. Um, uh, and the only way to address the concern is uh, bring it out to the forum of uh, international human rights and uh, really, uh, you know, uh, scrutinize it uh, and uh, do uh, legal, uh, comparative legal uh, analysis uh, with uh, other uh, countries' practices. 
Um, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, I mean, when I spoke to uh, um, uh, Taiwanese, uh, I, I, I told them and they agreed that uh, they should raise the bar now on human rights uh, in case any change in the uh, uh, power uh, in the uh, executive uh, or legislative branch uh, can um, can uh, start a, a chain reaction where uh, many of other human rights are uh, taken away. Um, so that uh, that's my answer to those two uh, questions. Wonderful, very important points here. I appreciate that. So I'm now turning to Heidi for concluding words. Well, thank you so much. It's an incredibly rich panel and I've given myself the uh, difficult task of trying to sum it up. I'm going to just note three major takeaways uh, for me, but of course there are many more and I have pages of notes. Uh, the first for me, the obvious, the scores are pretty low for international data governance. If we wanted to average it out, we'd end up at something like a four, which <laughs> would take us to a bit of a failing grade. And that's due to multiple pretty basic issues. As Susan pointed out, not understanding data's dual nature, using the lens of sovereignty, problems of escalation, fragmentation. As Stephanie put it, there's a lot of energy without coherence in this space. Um, the second thing that stood out for me is, of course, the, the basic, but again, very important point that data is more than personal data. We have non-personal data, we have commercial data, industrial data, as Masahiro San uh, pointed out to us. But it's also something, as, as Susan noted, that can help nations solve wicked problems. And we're not even sure what this data can do. But remembering that data is more than personal data is crucial in this conversation. And then third, um, a whole host of you reminded us of the importance of regional arrangements as well. Um, while Susan saw the need for, for global rules, a lot of you emphasized that potentially different models could work for different types of economies and maybe regional agreements are at least a place to start. As Henry pointed out, DEPA and CPTPP. Um, though KS, of course, warned us that we have to be careful about avoiding the escalation of competing regional blocks and suggesting that perhaps one way to do that is to focus on global norms like international human rights, a conversation that's very familiar to me from the world of content moderation, where this is, of course, something uh, that is often brought to the fore. And then perhaps at, at the end, my overall takeaway is, of course, if you want to work on uh, global trade anyway, you better be good with acronyms uh, because that's what is required um, but really thank you so much to our wonderful moderator Eve to Bergen thank you to our five panelists Susan Aronson Stephanie Honey Masahiro Kawai Henry Gao and KS Park just a tremendous amount of learning for us a wonderful exchange across multiple oceans we're really grateful to all of you and there'll be the third one in our series, um, which we'll talk about as Matthias's question points towards questions around securitization and the world of the digital. And that will take place on February 28th, uh, 2023 at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So subscribe to the newsletters of CSDI or SPPGA or follow Conwakai Chair or CSDI on social media to learn more about that event the powers we have upcoming. So it only remains to me to thank everybody again. Thank you for coming, whether it's your morning or your evening, and we will look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Au revoir, everybody.